Let's take a look at Monday in the NBA. There were six games on. Let's look at waiver wire trends, some injury updates to a lot of players, including Joel Embiid, Jared Vanderbilt, and Fred Van Vliet, and Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I invented the Gen Z Shake. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com, and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore bball, on TikTok at redrock underscore bball, and on Instagram at locked on fantasy basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers can get $200 in bonus bets if your first best bet of $5 or more wins. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Thank you also for making locked on fantasy basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms. Go ahead and give it the thumb, give it the bang, give it the bell, give it the comment, and of course, uh, go pre-bang. The live trade deadline show, Thursday, February 8, 1 p.m. We are three days away, so go ahead and get involved over there. We've got six games to talk about today. We've got other stuff to talk about as well, some news updates. Again, still loving or wishing I had a bit more clarity on certain things, like the Joel Embiid injury, but we got some level of... um, some level of, uh, I guess, information on it. Nothing nothing perfect, but one to two months is what they're saying now, but still depends on what happens when they go in. One to two months is a meniscectomy where they cut a piece of the meniscus off. There is no way that Joel Embiid is coming back in four weeks. I'm just That's just not going to happen. That's no way. Um, if they do decide to do a repair, then that is obviously all season, all playoffs over. And I still don't think there's any way that we are seeing Joel Embiid pop up in the fantasy playoffs. But if you have Joel Embiid, what are you dropping him for right now? Because I don't want you making moves to start this week. I I don't think he's going to be there. Again, I don't think it will bite you if you dropped him. But you also can just wait for a bit more information to come out. Eight weeks means that he's basically useless for fantasy. We know that. Um, Four weeks would be great, just not happening. And then there's the full season absences possibility as well. We're getting a lot of Weird, obfuscated injury reports. One of those is Jared Vanderbilt, who Woj just keeps saying and saying and saying, yeah, looks pretty bad, man. Might be the season. Yeah, pretty bad. Looks pretty bad. Then they go, oh, three to four week reevaluation. Again, the reevaluation is the key word. The other part is that remember how many reevaluations we've had this season where players have returned early from them, which is, again, very, very strange that they're doing that. So, yeah, look, we're not definitely not holding Vanderbilt. Look, that's cool. Like, we got this three to four weeks. He's not good enough to hold. Yes, as always, open IL slot. You would just put in there. There's no problem with that. But as a non-IL open player, there's just absolutely no way that we're holding on to Vanderbilt. The other one we got was Fred Van Vliet. And you would have seen it everywhere, aggregated in certain places, that Fred Van Vliet has a groin issue and he has no timetable to return without timetable. And I think it's misleading. i put it this way. It was. It came from one report, which said return time unknown. Fred Van Vliet is out, or he's been listed as out with a groin issue. Uh, they said groin strain for tomorrow's game. Fred Van Vliet is definitely out tomorrow. And then one reporter tweeted, no return time, or whatever it is. So that led people to then extrapolate that to mean like no timetable to return, which leads people to think out indefinitely, which leads people to think weeks and weeks and weeks. It leads people to think we must go and grab a Men Thompson, absolute must roster player, which I would agree if I knew that Fred Van, Vliet, Fred Van Vliet was out for weeks and weeks and weeks. The problem is the timing of this. I'll tell you some more about it in a sec. But we're obviously at the trade deadline. So the Rockets have five more games between now and the All-Star break. So the next two weeks. That's... If Van Vliet misses all that time, it's five games, and then it's another week. So it's three weeks in total he'd be off. And I would expect, almost worst case, I would expect that he is back after those five games. Is it worth burning an ad to Adam and Thompson where you might get one game out of him as the starter? 
And you'll say, Josh, it says no timetable to return. Yes, I dug into this. I asked around and the information that I got was that this is considered soreness and precautionary. So again, that would suggest one game. Soreness and I said the question I asked is like, what's going on? Like, what's this injury? Is this actually serious? Is it a long term thing? Is it a, a real strain? And I got soreness and precautionary with the two words that I got chucked towards me. I also got chucked towards me. Yeah, the um, but the Rockets medical staff is having a rough go of things. The consistent back and forth on Jabari Smith's ankle and whatever's going on with Tari Eason's legs. So be be aware of that as well. Like, okay, well that that sort of helps, but you're right. The Rockets have had a pretty rough go of things injury report wise and medical staff wise. But that initial report that came out and got disseminated everywhere was Fred Lee groin, no timetable to return out indefinitely. It makes people panic a lot. And I'm not sure it's the case. And if this was any other time of year, I'd be like, cool, just grab him, man. Even if you get one game out of him, totally okay. Because he's going to be, I think, pretty good in that role. And is five games enough to burn a waiver out on with the deadline coming up? It's borderline to me. It's borderline. In the end, I think I do default to like, fine. I love him, man. We love his game. This could last longer. But I think it's not as simple as Fred Van Vliet's out this long-term thing because that is not that is not the information that I've been told. But we will have to find out. Unfortunately, both OJ and Obi and Quentin Grimes are out again tomorrow. Grimes is going to be out the rest of this week, it appears, for the Knicks. So that continues to bump Hart, DiVincenzo, and then the big sneeze, Precious Chua. And then the other one we got in Charlotte was, hey, we've got something at least. Uh, Gordon Haywood is getting close to a return. Cool. Is Gordon Haywood worth a stash? Well, what does close to return mean? It's the it's the Hornets, so I've got no idea. B, how much is Haywood going to play? C, what his minutes going to be like? And is that worth burning a waiver wire ad right now on? Is he going to be better than any other options that pop up at the deadline? And I tend to think probably not. I think he's going to be a back-end player who's got a lot of risk with missed games down the, the, the line. And I think I'd rather miss out on Gordon Haywood because I think I can actually make up that value later on by holding on to that, that, uh, that move. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not. But that's how I would view that one. Let's look at some waiver wire trends. People have been very active on the waiver wire, despite the fact that it is the trade deadline coming up, and uh, I would be looking to preserve my moves a little bit more. The most added player over the last 24 hours is Lonnie Walker up 23%. We said, I don't know really where he's getting these minutes. I don't really like Lonnie as a category league player, but he's scoring well. I wouldn't waste an ad on him to stream in. And yeah, he didn't last at all today, did he? Absolute waste, that is. 23%. Brandon Pajemski up 17%. Not that bad on that one. With Wiggins out, with Pajemski playing well, with good value rest of season, that's an okay ad. Derek Jones up 13%. The absolute epitome, the guaranteed um, dictionary definition of wasting your waiver move. This might be people who have unlimited ads, absolutely. But that is what you do not do this week. Stream Derek Jones in Monday, Tuesday. He played 15 minutes today in deadline week. The dumbest of dumb. And I apologize if you guys watching this made that move. But man, what are you doing? Asar Thompson up 12%. Encouraging stuff from Asar. I don't know that it's going to last. I've got no idea. I know we can't trust Monty. That's borderline to me. It's like whether you make the ad and then burn the waiver move because I think he can have long-term value. So borderline. Trey Murphy up 8%. Definitely wouldn't have done that. Gary Trent up 8%. Definitely wouldn't have done that. I would not waste a move on these fringe stream players to add them in for today. That is not how I think is the right way to approach this. The most dropped players. Number one is Andy Wiggins down 15%. He's got this ankle injury at the moment. He's totally okay to move on from. But again, why would you need to drop somebody if you're not streaming, you don't. Andrew Nampard down 11%. Cool. Santi Aldama down 11%. Well, the Grizzlies and everyone's on the injury report again, including Santi. But if Tillman and Jackson don't play and they're not going to play, then Aldama could play big minutes next game. Interesting. Bill Isle down 11%. That's If you had Bill Isle, surely you were just stashing for the deadline. So I don't know why you would make that move to move on now. Jabari Walker down 11 Totally okay. And then the people that dropped DeAndre Hunter. A, I don't know why you had DeAndre Hunter. And then B, you dropped him today when he went absolutely bananas for a game which might be like a career best sort of performance. So that one, uh, that bites, that bites. Dropping him wasn't the incorrect decision. It's just the timing of it is not particularly uh, fun, I would think. 
Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Happy Super Bowl to those of you who celebrate. Thanks to FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Super Bowl Sunday, we've got to get our bets in order. We've got to get our food in order, our snacks in order, our couch positions, our guest list, all of that stuff. And it gives you one last opportunity to get your super bets in to get one last W for the football season, maybe two, maybe three. You can go and pick the winner of the game. You can go and check your Super Bowl MVP odds. You can go do an anytime touchdown score. You can do game totals. You can do coin toss results. I believe you can do the length of the national anthem over on FanDuel. So many different options for Super Bowl bets. And new customers, if you join today, you get $200 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. And don't forget to gamble responsibly. Okay. We're going to head into the games because that's what we need to do. Um, Yeah, we might as well. First game was the Dallas Mavericks, 118, smashing the Philadelphia 76ers, 102, the final score here. Um, We'll talk about Philly in a sec. Good win this one for Dallas. They get Kyrie and Luka both playing together. Kyrie had 23, 5, and 8, two steals and a block. Fantastic. Luca, not quite as good, really inefficient, but he had 19, 8, and 3 with four threes. Derek Jones, like I said, he started. He had five points in 15 minutes and uh, shot 29%. Not as bad as Tim Hardaway's 0 of 8 performance for zero points in 22 minutes. We knew that there'd be some issues with Hardaway when Irving came back, but he only played the 22 minutes here. I'd probably like to hold. Um, Grant Williams had a better game, 14 and 7, but I'm not reacting to that. It was also a good game from Muxy Kleber, who had 14, 4, and 5 in 28 minutes. Now, Muxy might not play tomorrow, given it's a back to back. And if we were in a streaming position or you had unlimited ads, he'd be a really good guy to have streamed in for this back to back, considering that Derek Lively's out for both of them. The question that I did receive today was hey, do we go and add Josh Green? Green had 20 points with six rebounds, four assists, and two steals on 67% shooting. And the answer is no. I'm definitely not burning an ad on Josh Green at this point in in trade deadline week for a guy that historically has shown he cannot do anything when he is playing next to Kyrie and Luka. This was great. 20 points is awesome. He took nine shots. Nine to get here. That is a true shooting of 93% on 17 usage. There is no world in which this is a 12-team league play. Because remember, if you add Josh Green, you don't get this game. So don't rush to add him. Although that is a very, very good game, without any question. Jaden Hardy popped in 17 in 15 minutes off the bench for the Sixers. We'll start with Paul Reed. Nick Nurse, again, told us before the game, yeah, Reed is still sick. Okay. Why they refuse to put him on the injury report, considering all their other injury report um, catastrophes so far, is absolutely mind-boggling to me. We found out last game that he was sick after the game. This game, we find out he's sick before the game. Still not on the injury report. Does that excuse him from having a terrible game? Nope, not at all. He had two points on 17% shooting. Horrid. He had six rebounds and a block. That's not a very good game. I am 100% holding Paul Reed. And I know what you're going to say, Josh. He is trash. You don't know what you're talking about. Why would we do this? Look at his last two games. And it's okay. That's cool. The game before, 7, 10, and 4, one steal, two blocks. The start before, 11, 6, and 3, one steal and two blocks. The start before, 30 and 13 with two steals. The start before, 8, 8, 2, 2, two steals, three blocks. The start before, 9, 9, one steal, two blocks. The start before, 16 and 6 on 58% shooting. The start before, 11, 7, and 3, four steals and a block. Do you want me to keep going? I will. The start before, 7, 2, and 4 and a steal. The start before, 15 and 10 with three assists, one steal, and three blocks. The evidence is very clear. It is there. All right? These are two bad games. I don't know how much the sickness has got to do with it. He still played the 22 minutes in this one. Again, didn't really close the game out. It was a blowout, but he, they didn't need to push him out there while he's ill. I'm definitely holding him. All right? To say that like he's terrible, I get it. He's not very good. He's fine. He's a fine replacement player who's solid enough and getting an opportunity. But we have seen it. We literally have seen it this season. We saw it three games ago that he can put up very, very consistently good fantasy numbers. So don't, react to it now. And what are you dropping him for now? To stream someone in at the start of trade deadline week? <sighs> no, thanks. Um, Toby Harris. I think he's going to have a monster run here. 17, 6, and 6 with two steals and a block, but I'd be a bit worried if I had Tyrese Maxey. 15, 2, and 7, bad efficiency. Now, we saw earlier in the season when Embiid was out around Christmas. I think it was around Christmas. That um, Maxey really did struggle without Embiid and his efficiency. So while we look at this and go, well, maybe it's a buy low, yeah, but Embiid's not coming. 
Giggity. He's not coming anytime soon. So maybe Maxi actually has a pretty poor run here. Ubre had 19 and 6. That's fine. His usage is going to be up while Melton and Embiid are out. And yeah, not much more. Marcus Morris had 10 points. Mo Bumba's a deeper league guy. He had 5 and 10 in his 18 minutes. That's a 14 team league type scenario there. Um, all right, let's take on the second game the Sacramento Kings and the Cleveland Cavaliers. In the end, pretty big win, or well, a huge win actually. For the Cavs, 136-110 over the Kings. Sabonis had his triple-double, 12, 19, and 15. He gets his triple-doubles every single game. No steals, no blocks, no threes, no free throws, 67% from the line. He's putting up good fantasy numbers, but a team worse, minus 25 here. Darren Fox's shoulder still continue to give him problems. 19, 4, and 2 with two steals on 40% shooting. His struggles really do continue. And the pencil, Harrison Barnes. Barnesy. On the surface, another great game. 22 points with six triples. Great. One rebound, zero assists, zero, one steal, zero blocks, no free throws. It just isn't going to continue like this. He's not going to get this many shots. He's not going to be this efficient. I wouldn't buy into it. Keegan Murray had 10 points combined in his previous two games. He had 10 points in the first quarter of this game. And he had zero points for the next three quarters. His inconsistency is maddening. 10-1-2 and two for Murray. He's outside the top 135 over the last two weeks. He is pushing closer to being outside the top 90 for the season. Still holding him, of course, but the up and down is always there. While Fanta Pants got his minutes back up, but on his production, 31 minutes for Kevin, 10, 3, and 4, while Monk had 18 in 24 minutes. And the back and forward between Murray, Monk, Barnes, Herder continues to be a frustrating thing for us to try and deal with. Trey Lyles had seven points in his um, 19 minutes and not much else going on. For the Cavs, Don Mitchell, 29, 2, and 5, great game. Winner Soldier, 26 minutes. Max Struess, 22, 5 and 2, 6 threes and 2 steals, 62%. Love to see a good game from Struess. Doesn't really change my opinion that he's a fringe 12 teamer, but that's a good game. And what he's really encouraging here is we saw both Jared, oh, Jared Allen, both Evan Mobley and Darius Garland see their minutes limit bumped up. 28 minutes for each guy. Mobley had 11, 14, and 7. 7 assists with 2 steals and a block, while Garland had 11, 2, and 5. They're still not fully all the way back but the minutes limit being upped. Jarrett Allen had 12, 9, and 7 with two blocks, and Levert, a nice 17, 6, and 7. Good points league guy, a borderline category guy, but that is a really strong game. Um, Okoro, just the two steals for him in 10 points in 25 minutes, and he's obviously not much of a fantasy guy, but it is just good to see Struess having a better game, and Modley and Allen's minutes limits being raised, and, and they, they crushed. They absolutely destroyed the old um, Sacramento Kings. Let's take a look at the next game, the Lakers taking on the Charlotte Hornets. We had a lineup change. Old mate Leaky Black jumps in to start in place of Bryce McGowan's. Why? I don't really know, but it's what happened and it didn't make a difference. The Lakers win 124-118. Anthony Davis triple-double, 26-15-11 and three blocks. D'Angelo Russell back to 40 minutes. The... I, I don't understand the coaching scheme, which is let's let D'Angelo cook. He had 28, 4, and 6 with five threes, 46% shooting. Big usage after some up and down the last three, four games. Big numbers. And Reeves was able to pull back with Russell going off. 9, 4, and 11 in 36 minutes. 30, 40 minutes for LeBron James against the Hornets is probably a few too many. He had 26, 4, and 7. Uh, and Rui played 29 minutes, and he was Rui. And that means not good. Nine and five in 29 minutes. And obviously we are not rostering Rui Hachimura in 10 or 12 team leagues and probably not 14. We're also not rostering Torian Prince who had nine points in 19 minutes. This is probably the first time I would say that Pockets has gone away from using Prince in a big minute role. For the Hornets, no Ball, no Williams, no Haywood, no Martin. I don't know when any of those guys are coming back. Again, maybe Haywood's back soon. I'm not sure. Let's talk Brandon Miller, because this is an absolutely red-hot run of things for Miller at the moment. 33, 4 and 3, 5 triples, 52% shooting, 4 steals. Love it. Unbelievable game. He shot 52% from the field. He had 36 usage. He shot 46 from 3. These are ridiculous numbers. He is, um, over the last two weeks, the 66th ranked player. Over the last week, a top 20 player. How hard are we selling this? Absolutely massive. I'll tell you why we're selling this so high. I just do not believe that Brandon Miller is going to be a 33 usage player. I don't believe he's going to combine 33 usage with 43% three-point shooting or 50% field goals. I don't think that a guy averaging 0.8 steals in 31 minutes is going to be dropping 2.3 steals, which he has over the last four games. He's getting still no assists. He gets no rebounds. His steals and blocks are way up at the moment, and he's hitting his threes at an incredible rate, taking 10 a game. 
I don't know if Haywood lasts the season. I don't know when he comes back or what he does. I don't know what happens with Ball. But I just find it hard to think that Miller is going to have such unfettered run with getting that much usage. Now, he's been great without question. The last five games have been awesome. The two games prior to that combined 17 points with 1-3. The two games prior to that combined 50 points. So he's had like a really strong run. He's had four games of 20 in a row, two stinkers, five games of 20 plus, and two in a row of over 30. He's really playing well. There's a lot of usage being pumped in. He's shooting really, really well. He's a very clear must roster, but you might be able to turn it into a top 30 or top 40 guy. You might. You might not, but you might. And if you can, I would very much recommend doing it. Miles Bridges played a lot as well. 41 in 40 minutes on 62% like Bridges. Just getting a lot of shots. And while Haywood's not awesome, he will eat into that somewhat. PJ played 34 off the bench, 15 and 8 with 4 assists. Continues to be pretty solid while Nick Richards... 4-9 and nine in his 32, remains a 12-team league player. Leaky Black had two points in his 16 minutes. Like, why was he there? I don't know. And Ish Smith, 8-2-5. and five. He's only a deeper league guy, Ish, while Lamello was out. And McGowan's probably his best game, or at least in recent memory. 10 points for Bryce in 24 minutes with two steals, but he's had many, many opportunities to start this season, and he uh, has not been successful in any of them, really, until today. Today's episode is brought to you by Better Help. There are so many things that uh, can get us down. We know that. And sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small. But getting those things off your chest could be helpful. Whether it is, again, just a trivial matter, whether it is like the frustration of your team's injury reports, or something that's more important in life, having the tools and the skills necessary to cope with those things is something you can learn through therapy. Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than what it, whatever's happening with our favorite sports team. But it is important to get things off your chest every once in a while to someone with an unbiased view. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit betterhelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That is betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. All right. Let's get to the next game. The LA Clippers take on the Atlanta Hawks. There was a change in Atlanta's lineup. Sadiq Bay returned from his ankle injury. He moved back into the starting lineup, replaced uh, Garrison Matthews, who started there in the last one. DeAndre Hunter still coming off the bench. The Hawks get it, uh, get it close, but the Clippers pull away. 149, that's a huge score. 149, 144 is the final score here in this one. Jimmy Harden. 39 minutes, 30 points, 8 rebounds, 10 assists. Just a, another crazy game. Two steals, a block. Kawhi was ridiculous, 36, 2 and 5. Paul George, again, limited, 6 fewer minutes than these guys. 18, 3 and 5 with two steals as he continues to play through this groin problem. He's a little bit of a buy low here, I think, Paul George. And with no Ivica Zubats, it's not a surprise to see Westbrook's value jump up. Westbrook played 15 minutes yesterday. He played 26 here. He had 13, 5 and 3, two steals and a block. Do not need to roster him. Plumlee had 8 and 9 in his 21 minutes, and Amir Coffey continues to do some nice things. 13 points for uh, Amir, the Farmers Union, in 26 minutes, and Norman Powell had 13 in 18 minutes. Both of these guys, Coffey's a 14-team streamer, and Powell is a 12-team streamer. Zubats will be back in the next one. For the Hawks, Trey Young continued to put up some good numbers, 25, 2, and 12, but DeAndre Hunter went absolutely bananas. And no, you don't have to add him. He played 19 minutes. He had 24 and 7 with two threes. And that's awesome. But let me reassure you of something. Or if I'm not reassuring, I'll assure you to begin with. He's not an 82% shooter who has 29 usage. None of that is real. So this is great. We don't care. We have seen DeAndre Hunter play 30 minutes a night for years and years and years and be nowhere near a must roster 12 team league player. One fluky high volume scoring game off the bench doesn't change it. So don't do anything with it. Bay was pretty good, 18 and 5, but he's still just a fringe guy to me. While Kongwu played 34 minutes, 18 and 5, two threes, a block, absolute must roster player. DeJounte Murray didn't do a huge amount with the shooting stuff. He had uh, 39% shooting for 21, 5, and 7. And just an absolute stinker from Jalen Johnson, 9, 7, and 5 on 21% shooting. He has these occasional really, really bad shooting nights, but otherwise, yeah, obviously he's good. And Bogdanovic, 16, 3, and 5. Not a lot, I don't think, out of that Hawks game, except just pouring a bit of cold water on the performance of DeAndre Hunter, which I think is uh, I think was necessary. The Golden State Warriors... 
and the Brooklyn Nets. That is the next game we're going to take a look at. And the Warriors, with Andy Wiggins out, they did go to Brandon Pajemski in that starting lineup. Uh, no one was shocked with that. We saw Pajemski get the good minutes last time out. And uh, he stepped up, and the Warriors get the win. 109-98 against the Brooklyn Nets. Kaminga continues to play at a ridiculous level. 28-10. and 10. He added two blocks. He's shooting well. He got to the line 12 times. He hit him. Like, he looks amazing at the moment. This is a completely different player since he cut his hair and since he complained about his coach in the media. Um, the minutes I'm fairly confident with. The usage I'm pretty confident with. The efficiency is a little bit up in the air because he's been bad at that stuff. He's rolling. He's dominating. This is a huge, huge run. Draymond had 8, 9, and 7, while Steph had 29, 5, and 3. But the Clay Thompson, whatever this experience is, continued 8 points. He did have two steals. He only shot nine times. He played 30 minutes. And honestly, he's not in their... Is he in their best four players, Clay? I'm not going to count Chris Paul because he's out. But Steph's their best. Draymond next, maybe? Pajemski? Kaminga? Where do they fit? They're better than Clay at the moment, yeah? As for Pods, he played 38 minutes. He had 15-11 with a block. Didn't shoot well. I love the minutes. I worry what the minutes will be like when Chris Paul and Andy Wiggins return. But again, he has to be in the rotation and he should be playing these big minutes. I don't mind an ad of Pajemski because I do think he can have some value here. Kevon Looney played 13 minutes and Sharich played four minutes. They're being phased out somewhat. Like these minutes should be just going to Trace Jackson Davis, who was a DNP. And my man, Lister Quinones, had three points in 24. And Moses Moody had four points in 15. Not much else to talk about there. Oh, yeah, Guy Santos, 9 and 6 in 18 minutes for the big fella. For the Nets, a couple of things to talk about with the Nets. There are so many things coming out about the Nets. Last season, they turned down four draft picks for Mikael Bridges. I believe that they turned down an offer of um, Anthony Simons and pick number three in the draft for Mikael Bridges. That is what I believe. I believe they've turned down a first-round pick for Royce O'Neal. I believe they've turned round, turned down two first-round picks for Dorian Finney-Smith. I believe they turned round, turned down was it Jalen Green and their own first-round picks back from the Houston Rockets for Mikael Bridges. That is some of the most embarrassingly bad GMing I've ever seen in my life. There are so many things they could have done. Mikael Bridges is a good player. He's not a number one. He's not worth all of that. Yet teams were giving it up, and you're still holding on. They could have restocked this team. Been in a situation where they got their draft picks back. They could have tanked because they're bad anyway and built up with real real asset base. I think that's been really bad from Sean Marks, if all of that is true. Claxton had seven blocks and got ejected. I don't think he'll be suspended, but he did get ejected. 15 and 5 in 32 minutes with no Ben Simmons. Cam Johnson was on fire early and then just didn't play. Don't know what happened. 13 and 8, three threes, one steal, two blocks. He's been playing much better, and this is basically what we thought he could be. Preseason. So look, yeah, he's turned it around after a stinking start. Mikhail Bridges had 13 and 6 on horrendous efficiency. And this is Cam Thomas. This is the problem with Cam Thomas. This is what I talk about with Cam Thomas when people say, you're an idiot. Why would you drop Cam Thomas? Look how we can go off. He had the 18 points, but yeah, no threes. 19% shooting on 21 attempts. And he hijacks a team. I just, I know he's improved, but I, he just, I'm still not there with him. Yes, you still roster him. And the 10 of 11 from the line is awesome. The two steals is good, but this is the downside. And then Lonnie Walker, five minutes, three points. Of course, we wondered how we would get 30 a night. Well, he's not going to, is he? Next game, Dorian Finney-Smith's probably going to be out, but Ben Simmons will return. And Dinwiddie played 39 minutes. He had nine, three, and five, and we are very, very easily jacking him off. Get that garbage out of here. With Simmons out and Walker out, Dennis Smith was great. 12, eight, and five, two steals, two blocks, 31 minutes, but... When Simmons plays, there's not enough uh, runway for Smith. We keep one eye on him in case there is a Dinwiddie trade and in case this role opens up. But I find it really difficult to believe that Smith and Simmons are going to be able to play significant minutes together. Um, this was a good game. Bit of an outlier, though, I think, for uh, old mate Dennis. The final game of the night was an absolute pantsing between the Pelicans and the Toronto Raptors. Uh, not good stuff from them. A couple of lineup changes. Trey Murphy went to the bench. Herb Jones returned from injury. And Bruce Brown started with Rowan Barrett uh, resting due to his knee injury. I guess that's why the Raptors lost, because the greatest player in the world, RJ Barrett, was out. Um, 138 New Orleans, 100 Toronto. Let's talk about the good. The prestige penis grade A dick. 22 points in 30 minutes with four threes. We have been talking about how they've been trying to enlarge his role a lot. 
They've been giving him minutes in situations where he didn't deserve, putting him into situations to make him sort of adjust to other starters. And finally today, we got the big minutes. Now, it was because Barrett was out and then Gaz Trent got injured at halftime. But he could be, now if I'm in deeper leagues, I'm okay with looking at him, but he could be a guy that middle of March is putting up fringe 12-team value. Pirtle played 28 minutes, 14 and 9 on a back-to-back with two blocks. That's awesome. Well, what's uh, what's actually going on with um, all-star legend face of the league, Scott Barnes? 25 minutes, 17, 5 and 4, bad shooting, 41%. Two blocks is good, but he's just off the last couple of games. Quickly's also in a big buy low, 8, 1 and 6. And Bruce Brown had 9, 3 and 3. Brown is a hold until the deadline and that is it. Uh, Quickly's obviously a hold as well. While Schroeder, who was ridiculous last game, had zero points in 18 minutes. So I feel a lot better about saying, yeah, you can drop Dennis Schroeder because you can drop Dennis Schroeder. Gary Trent had two points in his 15 minutes. He is not a 12-team league player in my opinion either. We also got the wiki Chris Boucher back. He's been out of the rotation. He had 11 and 6 in 12 minutes because the entire fourth quarter was blowout garbage time. For the Pelicans, Ingram, 30 minutes, 41, 6 and 8 with 8 threes. That's a huge game. McCollum, 20 and 6 with 6 triples. A huge game. Zion played only 22 minutes and he had 16, 3 and 5. The Dustbuster, Dyson Daniels, 5, 3, and 4 with 3 steals. Trey Murphy, 10 and 6. Valanchunas only played 20 minutes with Larry Nance available. They split the minutes. But I don't know how much we take out of this because it was a blowout. I'm still not convinced that Trey's a 12 team league guy. I'm not convinced that Herb is. He had 5, 2, and 1 in 22 minutes. Just so easy, though, this game that we just didn't need to see um, any level of big minutes out of any of their players, realistically. And that is the games. So that'll bring us now to take a look at the stream of the day recap. It wasn't a particularly good streaming day. And again, you shouldn't have been streaming anyway. But Paul Reed stuffed us up really in a big way. Look, he was not very good today. 2, 6, and 0 with a block. Pajemski was very good as a 12-team guy. 15 and 11 with three assists and a steal. Prince is a 14-teamer. Probably didn't cut it. 9 and 4 with an assist for him. Your 16-team streams, Mo Bumba. Oh, that's all right. 5 and 10 with a block. That's He's definitely fine in that sort of a league. And your points league streamers was Pajemski. For Yahoo, he had 35.7. And for ESPN, he had 33 fantasy points. And all of that, all that works out pretty well, I reckon. That takes us in to look at the lines of the night. So who was the monstrous line of the night? It came down to two guys. One of them named Brandon Ingram and one of them named Jim Harden. In the end, Jimmy gets it. 30 and 8 with 10 assists. He is your monstrous line of the night. He is continuing to have an amazing season for the Clippers. Your waiver wire line of the night. The best performer available in over 50% of leagues. Um, I can't remember who we gave it to. Oh, yeah, we went to Dallas, and we went to Josh Green, who had 20 points with six rebounds and four assists. A massive performance there. I'm not really reacting to it. The young gun of the night, this one is not complicated whatsoever. Your best performance from a rookie or a second-year player, and it does go, of course, to Brandon Miller, who is on fire. Massive shot attempts, massive efficiency, got the steals, had 33 points with four steals. Just a huge hot streak. Sell, top 50. Sell it if you can. If you can't, just enjoy what's happening. And the last one we look at is the dud of the night. Well, we're going to go back to Josh Green's teammate, Tim Hardaway, because he had zero points and missed all eight of his field goal attempts. An absolutely horrific performance. Let's take a look at the top six players for today. We'll start off with the top six category league performers of the day. Number one there is James Harden. It was very closely followed by Brandon Ingram then Anthony Davis, Kawhi Leonard, Trey Young, and DeMontis Sabonis. Your top six players under 50% rostered, Josh Green, DeAndre Hunter, not reacting to either of those two games. Sadiq Bey, not really a must to me either. Dennis Smith, great. Don't think it continues. Great A. Dick, maybe. In deeper leagues, maybe. And Muxy Kleber, it'd be a great stream if we knew that he would playing tomorrow and it wasn't trade deadline week. Your top six players in points leagues, number one is Anthony Davis, followed by Brandon Ingram, Jim Harden, DeMontis Sabonis, Brandon Miller, and Kawhi Leonard. Lastly, again, don't prioritize ads at this point, but some things to take away. If you're in a deeper league, at least keep an eye on Grady Dick. Amen Thompson with the Fred Van Vliet thing, that's a tough one for me to judge. Again, my info is telling me precautionary soreness, so maybe not long-term. Brandon Pajemski, actually think that's not a bad use of a waiver ad. The guys you can drop, well, you can obviously jack uh, Mason Plumlee, and you can obviously jack Spencer Dinwiddie. I'd feel pretty okay about jacking Russell Westbrook there in that situation as well. That was a pretty light on Monday day. 
um, in terms of game action or actionable information in fantasy, and that's okay as well. So when you are here watching the video, hey, good to see you guys here. Go and hit the subscribe button, go and hit the thumbs up, go and uh, ring the bell, and leave your comments down below and on audio. Come and double bang and watch the video as well. Don't forget, trade deadline. I'll see you all there, guys. We're done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.